Good morning. Happy Sabbath. We're continuing our study in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. As Pastor Ross mentioned, we're on lesson number 10 today, worshiping the Lord. And we have a memory verse. Memory verse actually comes from Ezra because we're studying both Ezra and Nehemiah. And they're, they're books that overlap chronologically and historically. So if you look in Ezra 3 verse 11, this is our memory verse from the New King James Version. Uh, we're going to say it together. Ezra 3.11. Are you ready? And they sang response. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. I'll give you a chance to find it. Ezra 3.11. Let's say this in unison. Ready? And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever towards Israel. Now, you know that particular phrase there, the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever, is found 41 times in the Bible. That's a lot. The Lord is good, and especially the part, his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. Uh, the very fact you're here today is evidence that God is a merciful God. He has been mercy, merciful to you throughout your life. Now, the lesson today is on worshiping the Lord and our mission. You know, we're going through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Today, we're specifically dealing with Nehemiah, and we're specifically dealing with chapter 12, only verses 27 to 47. That's our mission. Whole lesson covers those verses. And, um, and we've got plenty here to talk about. I could stop right here and say, all right, let's talk about worshiping the Lord. And uh, we come to church, we worship the Lord, and... Uh, a lot of examples of worshiping God in the Bible. What is worship? It just was confusing to me. You know, if you grow up in a secular world and someone says, we're going to go worship, I go, what does that mean? I you picture someone bowing to a statue of Buddha? Um, I wasn't sure, what does worship mean? Worship really springs in English from the idea of worship. But God is worthy. Might I suggest to you, I used to think when people say we're going to go to church and worship the Lord, I had pictures of, you know, you went to Catholic church when I was a kid. I went to a couple of Catholic schools and then, you know, they'd say these chants and you'd go through the mass and I thought, oh man, when is this over? I thought, no really, I thought worship was the most boring thing in the world. I'd like to submit to you that if you ever discover what real worship of God is, there is nothing more thrilling, more, more pleasurable, and more uh, fulfilling and exciting than genuine worship. People think about going to heaven and what are you going to do? And there's a lot of things, neat things that I think I like to, I love to explore. Just the idea of it, we'll mount up with wings like eagles, I love to fly. Soar to worlds unknown. That's not in the Bible. That's in Rock of Ages. But it's going to happen. We'll go, we're so, sort of uh, go visit unknown galaxies and cosmos. I can't wait to explore. And to see the earth made new and build. We'll build houses and inhabit them. I love puttering around and building and working in the yard. And I can think of all those things. But biblically, the highest thrill, the greatest pleasure for those that knew God was to worship God. So when it says that from one new moon to another and one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come before the Lord to worship him. You think about when Isaiah had that picture of the angels in the presence of God and the whole temple was filled with smoke and the building shook and the angel said holy, holy, holy. And that was so thrilling. It was so frightening and exciting to be in the presence of God. So when you think about worshiping God, realize that understanding what real worship is is one of the most important pursuits. Um, it's being in the presence of the creator and sustainer of the universe is awesome when you think about it. And uh, so that's really what we're dealing with. Now in Nehemiah chapter 12, 27, I've got a couple of you that are going to help me with some verses here. But in Nehemiah 12, 27, it begins by saying, now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem. So they're going to bring all the different Levites in. They don't all live in Jerusalem. They live in suburbs around the cities. 
to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and with singing, with cymbals and with stringed instruments and harps. They're going to have a great celebration. What's the occasion? To dedicate the, um, the walls. Now, if any of you ever moved into a house, did you have a house of dedication? You know, in the Bible, that was appropriate. Um, we're really excited yesterday uh, afternoon washed my truck and then I drove up on the building site because I've been out of town for a couple days and I'm always excited to see what kind of progress is happening on the house of the Lord on the hill. And so uh, I went up there to look around and it's, oh, they got the windows going on the back, the walls are all taking shape, you can kind of see where things are going to be and it looks like the, the Lord has had this long fall, we may get it closed in before the rains come and we're, we're very excited but you know we're planning a dedication. And we're thinking about picking dates now. We're close enough where we think, you know, we're going to bring in some people. They need to know. We want to have a date for a dedication. And we thought, actually, we want to have a month of dedication. Let's not just do one week. There's so many ways and people to thank and things to do to celebrate this place set aside to be a house of prayer, a house of proclaiming the word. And so it's appropriate to have a special Dedication, when you thank everybody for the work, thank everybody for the gifts and, and to praise God for something that's accomplished. You know, in the Bible, they not only dedicated houses of the Lord, they dedicated houses. Look in Deuteronomy 20, verse 5. It was so important that before soldiers went into battle, the priest would stand before the soldiers and they'd make this statement. They say, if any of you are afraid, go home. Lest you cower in the battle and you frighten the other soldiers. He said, if you married a wife and you have not taken her, in other words, if you are betrothed to a wife and you've not taken her yet, then leave. You should have that experience. And then it says, and what man is there of you who has built a new house and have you not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And so, that was so important that you dedicate your home. You build a home. And you know, that's, you think about it. It says, you know, uh, it, it's important. If you planted a vineyard, you didn't eat from it. If you are engaged to a woman and you've not been married. If you built a house and you've not dedicated it. They said those were three reasons to walk away from the battle. Plus if you're afraid. But they said a man ought to experience these things before he goes and fights like a soldier and dies. And so I thought that was interesting. But uh, not only did they dedicate homes, you know, when a child is, uh, you know, born shortly after, don't we have a dedication? Dedicate children. They would dedicate homes. We know they dedicated temples. You can look here in, um, matter of fact, I think one of you are going to read for me uh, 1 Kings 8, 63. You've got that? Um, there was actually a psalm that they would sing at a dedication of a house of the Lord. Now when you read the Psalms, you probably jump right to verse 1. But you know a lot of the Psalms actually had titles. And the title of Psalm 30, it says, A song at the dedication of the house of David. Not the house of the Lord. The house of David. So when David, do you remember in the Bible? Hiram gave him materials, cedars from Lebanon, and sent workers down to build a house for David when he became king. And he had a psalm to dedicate that house. Um, all right, go ahead, read for us, please, uh, 1 Kings 8. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offering, which he offered to the Lord, 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. So when the, when the temple of Solomon was built, there was a great dedication service. And don't forget that about the incredible sacrifice that was made. Because later in the lesson we talk about sacrifices. Look in Second Chronicles 5, 13 and 14. Solomon is praying here. Now you have the dedication of the temple both in First Kings and in Second Chronicles. It's the same story. Indeed it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. 
that when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music, and they praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And that's what we just quoted from Ezra, isn't it? That the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so the priest could not continue to minister because the cloud, for the glory of the Lord, filled the house of God. Now, wouldn't you like to see that experience repeated? That uh, Karen and I were reading in our Sabbath worship, and uh, we're reading this book on prayer, and they talked about every aspect of prayer, E.M. Bounds, you can possibly think of, they talk about, and they talk about what makes a church different from other buildings is it's a house of prayer and how prayer consecrates it. But it's not just prayer, it's praise. Look what happened. When they began to sing, to praise God, and including the instruments of music, well, there was a worship that was taking place there. The glory of the Lord so filled the temple that the priests couldn't go in. I'm not talking about the Holy of Holies where you had the Shekinah glory. They couldn't even go into the holy place because the glory of the Lord was so intense that it was like, you know, I don't know, like an oversized arc welder in there. There's the brightness and the smoke coming out that they just couldn't handle it. And it was too bright for them. Wouldn't you like to have that problem? That'd be frightening. It says the presence of God is like a consuming fire. And the glory of the Lord, it was a sign of his approval. You know, there's only a few times in the Bible when fire came down from heaven, came down on the sacrifice of Abel, we believe, came down when Moses built the temple and uh, to inaugurate that first tabernacle. The fire of the Lord comes down to inaugurate this tabernacle. It came down on the altar of Elijah to inaugurate, to approve, show approval for his worship. So when that fire comes down and accepts the sacrifice, it was usually a sign of God's blessing and his approval with his presence. So do you have worship in your home? Do you want the fire to come down in that temple? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you sing praises to God? The Spirit comes in. Some of you remember the story when uh, Jehoshaphat went to battle against Moab, Edom, and the Ammonites. God said, you'll not have to fight in this battle. You just go out put the band and the orchestra out front, sing to the glory of God and watch what happens. And the Lord went and fought for them. So the enemy all turned on each other. So I think we underestimate the importance of music and worship in a successful Christian living. Psalm 71, and I could read many Psalms along this line. Also with the lute, I will praise you and your faithfulness, O my God. And I will sing with the harp, O Holy One of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing. Now something I thought was interesting here in that previous verse, it talks about um, they played with these different instruments, with trumpets, cymbals, instruments of music, and maybe that's not the one I'm looking for. It talks about harps and stringed instruments. And I wondered, harps, well, I don't know what a harp is. In fact, the Greek word for harp is guitarra. Does that sound familiar? And in Spanish the word for guitar is guitarra. Because a harp, a guitar is really a form of a harp instrument. It's just got the fingerboard on it. Uh, but um, I wondered what the other stringed instruments were. It says stringed instruments and harps. So it's probably many different varieties. So they bring all these instruments before the Lord to praise the Lord, inaugurate the temple. Psalm 57 verse 9, I will praise you, O Lord, among the people. I will sing to you among the nations. So one of the things they were doing is they were singing loudly and the other nations and the pagans that lived among them were hearing them sing. You know, when others hear you sing the songs of God, it has a converting influence. Do You know, the, the infancy of the Salvation Army. Uh, they would go out on the streets of London and they would sing, they would ha have testimonies, and they would sing, and a lot of the people that were struggling with sin and alcohol in the streets, they'd hear the music, they'd be drawn in, then they'd hear the testimonies, they'd hear them give praise reports, and they'd be invited to you know, accept the Lord and turn from their sins, and it was spreading like crazy, but music, in, the Salvation Army had their own hymn book because they'd written hundreds of songs, 
And music was really like a foundation of what their ministry was. Um, David was known as a musician. Middle of the Bible has 150 songs. He's the greatest king. But he understood the importance of the right kind of music and the power of music. Now there's good music and there's bad music. And some people say, well, it depends on what culture you're in. I say there's good music and bad music for every culture. And uh, I mean, just like you've got God and the devil everywhere, <laughs> there's the good and the bad. And there's different kinds of music for different occasions. Um, even in church, there's lots of good music, but there's different kinds of music for different occasions. If we're doing an evangelistic meeting, the music you sing might be a little different. An appeal following a sermon, you want the appropriate music for the appeal. Um, if you're singing a lullaby, you've got a different, you know, all over the world, lullabies are the same. You got music for war. Do you know in the Bible there were songs they sang with drums as they went off to battle? And there's songs they sang when they came back from battle. Miriam and the women went out with tambourines. David and Saul came back from battle and the women that went out and they sang songs of victory. And so there's different kind, there's romantic music. Some people think that love songs must be all of the devil. No. In the right context, there is romantic music. And uh, you wouldn't sing romantic music as you're getting ready to go to war. That would not put the men in the right frame of mind. <laughs> you definitely would not do a lullaby as you're getting ready to go off to war. And so the, the right kind of music, it might be good music, but there's also right occasions for it. And there's a whole study on that. But, you know, Martin Luther was quite a singer. And one of the ways he earned his keep as he went through school is he would go from door to door and sing for money. And that made me feel pretty good because I used to play music for money. I used to panhandle and beg. I couldn't sing very good, but I'd play the flute or play guitar. I, sometimes I'd be with friends who could sing. And uh, we'd panhandle. I said, Martin Luther did that. I thought, all right, I'm not alone. <laughs> But he understood the power of music. And uh, with the Protestant Reformation, almost as much as the teaching was the songs they began to sing. See, during the Dark Ages, they had people singing in foreign languages words they didn't even understand, chants and stuff. It didn't mean anything. Music was meant to be instructive. And Moses told the children of Israel, he says, these words of your experience should be put into song so that your children will remember them. So scripture songs are great for that purpose. Who was it? Um, Plato said, give me the music of a nation and I will change the mind of that nation. Music is a secondary language to express. Confucius said, if one should desire to know whether a kingdom is well governed or if its morals are good or bad, the quality of its music will furnish the answer. Andrew Fletcher said, I knew a wise man who believed that if every man was permitted to make all of the ballads, he needed not care who should make the laws of a nation. If you could control or adjust their music, you can adjust their morals. I think we underestimate the power of music. Now with that in mind, what's the typical music like if you surf through the radio? Uh, music is not neutral. Listening to it affects you. There's been a number of studies and the, the jury is in. Music has a physiological effect on you as you listen to it, for good or bad. And um, how many of you have ever caught yourself, you go into some public place and they've got background music. And you know, a lot of stores I can name right now as you're walking around, they've got music playing. Do you think they just play what's local on the radio? No, supermarkets have their own station of specially chosen music to put you in a serene state of mind where you will not think or care about how much something costs. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. They, they play music that's kind of happy and upbeat and light and you just say, ah, queso raso, I don't care how much it costs, you know. And it, it, it makes people, they find certain kinds of music. I mean, if, if you're walking through the market and you're hearing da, 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 you're not gonna buy anything. That's very somber music. <laughs> So there's a psychology to that. And I find myself going into, you know, when you become a Christian, there's certain kinds of music that you may have known before you were a Christian, and you don't want to sing those songs because 
they don't have the right message. And, um, but you still know them. And so, you know, I go into the store and uh, I come out and I jump in the car and I'm going, yesterday love was such an easy. Karen goes, what are you doing? Oh, <laughs> you know, I just in the star side here. <laughs> I said, I need that song. <laughs> so what do you do? Then you start singing, he's able, he's able. <laughs> you try to overcome evil with good. Uh, you know, we're laughing, but it really is serious because uh, I remember I got in a car. I was in Southern California going to Palm Springs to speak at an amen meeting. It's a group of doctors, and I was late, and I was supposed to be there. And I got my rental car, and I, I, I jumped in the car, and I'm trying to pull out the map and hand them my license as you pull out of the gate. And, uh, you know, then you got to adjust your mirrors. You're in a new car. You're trying to be safe, and you're in a hurry. And I'm looking at the watch, I'm looking at the GPS, and I must have been 10 minutes down the road before I realized that from the time I turned the ignition in the car, 10 minutes later, the radio had been going the whole time with terrible music. But I was so busy with what I was doing, and in our culture, you hear it so often in the background. I like eating at Chipotle, but the music they play there is terrible sometimes. And I've had to go to them several times. I'm trying to talk to someone. I'm already a little deaf. I said, could you please turn it down? They got a volume. They can control it, the house music. And if there's not a lot of people in there, I'll go and say, do you mind? I said, look, I'm deaf. Could you just turn it down while I'm here so we could talk? No problem. They turn it down. They hear the same thing all day long. They don't care. But sometimes it's the wrong kind of music. We hear it so much in the background. You wonder how much does that affect us? So you got to compensate by trying to listen to the right kind of music and praising the Lord with the right kind of music. So, music was a very important part of their worship program. Music can be a great power for good. Testimonies, volume 4, verse 71. Music rightly employed is a precious gift of God designed to uplift the thoughts to high and noble themes and to elevate the soul. It's Education 167. Song is one of the most effective means of impressing spiritual truth on the heart. That's the book of evangelism. I think a good evangelistic program, you should incorporate good music. If you can't get good music, don't have any music. But you want good music. Music was made to serve a holy purpose, to lift the thoughts to that which is pure, noble, and elevating. That's the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 594. So, Music is very much part of worshiping the Lord, just as the proclamation of the word is. Can you say amen? amen. All right, someone's going to read for me uh, our next verse where we're dealing with the section of purification. If you would do that for us, I'll appreciate it. Nehemiah 12, 30. Mm -hmm. Then the priests and Levites purified themselves and purified the people, the gates and the wall. All right, they're getting ready to dedicate the gates and the wall. We talked about purifying or... Um, dedicating a temple, dedicating a house, to dedicate a baby. Jesus was eight days old when he was brought to the temple. Now they're going to dedicate a wall. Well, they built this to the glory of God. It's the walls of Jerusalem. And, but before they do that, you know, whenever you're involved in a construction project, um, there's sometimes some garbage. So before you're going to dedicate it, what do you think they had to do? It says they needed to purify it. Well, how do you purify the gate and the wall? Do they sprinkle holy water on it? Well, probably what happened, where do you think they brought the garbage? That was to, to, brought to the gates. As a matter of fact, one of the gates in the story of Nehemiah, it's still there today, they called it the dung gate, the garbage gate. Things went out of the city to keep the city clean, and they usually took it down to the Valley of Hinnom, and there was a, a landfill down there. Um, if you live in the suburbs of Sacramento, you probably once or twice a week, you roll your can out front by your gates. And someone comes by and picks it up, right? You know, it was the most interesting thing in Taiwan. They've got, uh, it's a very clean city. Uh, I don't know if it was always that way, but they've got this practice where early in the morning, you're not allowed to leave your garbage out on the streets because they didn't want problems with rats. So early in the morning, uh, you'll hear the garbage trucks come up the street and they play music, you know, like our ice cream trucks. 
and they play this some classical music and everybody hears it, you're to run out while the truck is there, you give them your garbage and you go back in. You cannot leave your cans out on the street. Every citizen brings their garbage out and they've got to be ready or you have to live with your garbage until he comes by again. It's, and so they keep it a very clean city. But a lot of places they kind of keep it at the gate. So it meant they would clean up the garbage, maybe partly from construction, other garbage, and the walls. Now I won't go into detail, but if you read your King James Version, one of the words they describe boys, there's an interesting phrase they used to describe males. I'm not going to tell you what that phrase is. You just have to read that in the King James Version. But the wall was also the latrine. And so when they said to sanctify the walls and to sanctify the uh, gates. Deuteronomy 23.14. Do you know that in the law of God they had a little sanitation law. They said that uh, everybody was to have a, a stick with a paddle on an end for a practical purpose when they went through the wilderness for the purpose of sanitation. And God said you're to keep the camp clean. For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp. He wasn't just isolated to the sanctuary. He walked among them. To deliver you and to give your enemies over to you. Therefore your camp shall be holy that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. Now that, that verse stuck with me. If you want God, and certainly that would also be true of his angels to hang out with you, be clean. Does that make sense? God wants our homes to be clean. Are, are we wanting to witness for the Lord? One of the ways we witness for the Lord is by keeping things clean, neat, orderly, try to not have things pile up and, and uh, Christians should not be hoarding stuff. Do you realize you can't take that stuff with you? I'm at the stage where people are, my kids sometimes are saying, giving me things. I say, you realize when I'm gone, I got to give it back to you. I said, how long do you want me to store these things? <laughs> Isn't that right? Naked I came into the world. Naked I'm going to go. And so we shouldn't be trying to see how much we can collect. If anything, we should be minimizing and investing in God's work. Amen? So keep clean. Numbers 19.19 19 says, And on the seventh day he shall purify himself, wash his clothes and bathe in water. So part of the purification of the camp was they would physically clean, they would wash their clothes. Some of you remember that before God gave the Ten Commandments, what was one of the things that he told the children of Israel? He said, wash yourselves and be ready against the third day God is going to meet with you and wash your clothes. And they were to clean up and come into the presence of God. Um, so uh, if you read in uh, Daniel chapter 12, when we're talking about purifying, it's not just the clothes and the body, though the sanitation is important. What does it mean for a Christian? Daniel 12.10, many shall be purified, made white, and refined. Is that just talking about physical purity or heart purity? When it's talking about you're going to be refined, but the wicked will do wickedly. So what does the purified talk about? Blessed are the pure in heart. So as they're getting ready to dedicate the walls and the gates, there's to be a purifying. You know, your mind is a temple. And God has given you gateways to the soul. You've got certain walls. You want them purified. You know, your eye is a gateway to your heart. You've got to screen what comes in. Your ears, your mouth, all of your senses. You get to make choices about what you listen to, what you watch, what you hear, what you say. And I think that uh, there's a statement in the spirit of prophecy that we're to guard the avenues to the soul and keep those things pure. If we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses. That word cleanses can be substituted with purifies. The blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Why? As we walk in the light. You know, one reason God took the children of Israel through the desert is because deserts, do you have less chance of catching a cold in a desert? You've got a lot better chance of getting an infection and catching a cold if you're in a tropical climate than if you're in a desert. The sun in the desert tends to sterilize things. 
And he brought them through this purifying environment where they could be uh, healed and cleansed. Finally, now how do we guard the gateway to our souls? Brethren, whatsoever things, how many of you know this verse? It's a good one to memorize. Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That's a good, uh, that's a good quote. If you've got a desk or if you've got a place where you have a poster you look at, you might want to put that up. Because one of the hardest things to do as a Christian is maintain your thinking in a positive way. Uh, there's a lot of negative things in the world. If you want to think about negative things, there's plenty of ammunition. A lot of negative things out there. Uh, try to hang out with positive people for one thing. And if you've got a good Christian friend, and if you're married, encourage each other to say and to thank those things that are just and noble and lovely and pure and of good report. And that should, uh, the, what we choose to watch um, or listen to should fit in that category. Romans 12 verse 9, arbor what is evil, means hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Someone said it's not enough if you're a good gardener to love flowers, you need to hate weeds. Job was a perfect and an upright man who loved God and hated evil. <clears throat> Psalm 101 verse 3, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. That's an excellent test in this day. You know, we have more screens. We're, we're living only one generation away from people who had no such thing as a television. But not only are there TVs now, people have their laptops, they got their tablets, they got their desktop computers, they got their phone screens. You go on an airplane, there's a screen. I stopped to pump gas, and all of a sudden I heard voices. I turned, and there's a commercial playing on the pump. It's got a screen on it. There was a restroom, some public place. You go in the restroom, they got monitors, so they don't want you to waste any time while you're standing there. It's advertising stuff. So we are surrounded, have you any of you seen that yet? We are surrounded with messages. And so as a Christian, boy, for one thing, uh, it's impossible to not be influenced by that to some extent. This week I was up at the, the cabin in um, uh, Kovalo. And I, I knew we had a problem because I was, uh, I was working in the kitchen and I heard this loud scratching. And I went into the, the restroom and I thought, there's a mouse in the bath. And I opened up the shower door and there's no mouse, but I could hear it scratching. I got down on my knees and I listened and right underneath the bathtub, there's some mouse nest, a rat's nest. And you're hearing all this activity and stuff and there's no way to get to it. It's under the floor. And so I pounded on the tub and it got quiet for a minute and then it came back again. I thought, oh man, that's going to be a problem. I was starting to smell something a little strange anyway. And the only way to deal with it is I got to crawl into the house. It's in the middle, in the back of the house. Brightest part of the day, it's dark back there. Full of black widows. And so I had to put on some dirty clothes because I knew there is no way I can go under there crawling around and not come out dirty. There's just no way. And uh, so, you know, it's, you get out, and then I'm, I still I haven't dealt with the rat yet. I put some poison out. But so I got out, and uh, I'm slapping my stuff. Dust is flying everywhere. I'm dusting myself. As you can't, and that's kind of what it's like in this world, is trying to keep your mind clear and pure. It, it requires an extraordinary effort. The only way you can do it is to have the Holy Spirit. And you got to put on special clothes <laughs> to, uh, to be able to hazmat suit, I guess. Job says in Job 31 verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? And in the following verses, he talks about faithfulness to his wife. You know, there's an epidemic, absolute epidemic of pornography because it is so readily available. They say that... Um, one-third of all streaming material that goes to computers is pornographic. That's staggering when you think about it. You need to make a covenant with your eyes. This is men and women. All right. Going on to the next section. Two large Thanksgiving choirs. 
If you read in Nehemiah chapter 12, now I'm not going to read all of this. I'm going to jump a little bit because I'll confess there's a lot of names in there and I will probably be struggling through some of them. So let me get to the heart of it. Nehemiah 12, 31. So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall and appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. So he gets them in stereo. One went on the right hand of the wall towards the refuse gate. No, nothing about, I mean, they're, they're not the refuse choir. It's just that's where the direction where it was. And after them went some of the priests, the sons with the trumpets, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra, the scribe, went before them by the fountain gate in front of them. And they went on the stairs of the city of David, on the stairway of the wall beyond the house of David, as far as the water gate eastward. And the other Thanksgiving choir, I'm in verse 38, went the opposite way, and I was behind them. This is Nehemiah. So Ezra is with one group, Nehemiah is with another group, with half of the people on the wall. So the two Thanksgiving choirs stood in the house of God. Likewise, I and the half of the rulers with me, and the priests and the singers sang loudly with Jezariah, the director. So they got a choir director. That's important. Also, that day they offered great sacrifices, and they rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard far off. Now they just didn't go into the temple and shut the doors. They didn't have some secretive cult where they say, well, there's no windows because we don't want anyone to see what we do in here. They actually, not just are in the temple, they get up on the walls on two sides of the city, massive choir, and they're seen in response to each other, maybe they're doing parts. You know, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen is as I've traveled through the South Pacific, uh, boy, some of those islanders can really sing. And I was in Micronesia years ago, and they had a Ponapean children's choir. Ponape is the capital of Micronesia. And those kids, it's like they don't need any lesson. They, they all know how to sing, but not just how to sing, they all knew how to sing parts. And, you know, we can be trained. You get all these different parts in the note. But they would sing, and they would offset each other. Think, Jesus is come, coming again, every morning, night, and noon. And they're all singing these different parts of the song going, and it's like they're not even trying. But it was so beautiful. They actually took them on a tour in America, and they cut a record. It was su such an amazing uh, singing group. Well, the Hebrews were singing like that. And they're singing parts, and they're playing the instruments. Now, why did they go up on the walls? They want the other nations to hear them. Keep in mind, it's not just them. You read through the story of Nehemiah, they had a lot of problems with the other nations that had intermarried with them, that were doing business on the Sabbath. They're surrounded with other nations that had moved into the land while they were in Babylon. And they're still there. And they did not have the right to chase them out, like when they came with Joshua. It's not theirs now. It belongs to the Persian king. And so they are singing and glorifying God on the walls so others will hear them. You remember the story where Paul and Silas are in jail and they've been whipped. But instead of complaining, they praise God and they sing. And what happens? The angel of the Lord comes and there's an earthquake and the prison shook and the doors are open. But it says the other prisoners were listening to them and the doors were opened because the other prisoners were listening to them. And so their, their music actually liberated the others, but they were singing because the others could hear them. And so it's a witness. And so they have these two great choirs, and they're doing it how? Great joy. They rejoiced. Even though they'd been through struggles, they're rejoicing. You know, I've read the book of Jonah a hundred times. That may not be an exaggeration. And uh, I heard some, I was listening to a sermon on the radio yesterday, and a pastor highlighted something, the end of Jonah's prayer, that you know when God set Jonah free? Jonah was in the belly of the whale. When does Jonah actually set free? In the last part of Jonah's prayer, he says, but I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Then the fish gets instructions to burp him out and set him free. After he thanks the Lord. Now, would you thank the Lord inside a fish? You know, I'm amazed in Daniel chapter 6, before Daniel goes to the lion's den, he kneels down three times that day, he prays and gives thanks. Did Daniel know what was going to happen? He knew about the law. 
and he still thanks the Lord. In all things give thanks. So one of the things our choirs should be doing is what? They called it Thanksgiving choirs. That doesn't mean once a year in November. It means their choirs were giving thanks. These are choirs of joy and gratitude. And then one more thing. Oh, I've got so much I could say. First Chronicles 25, verse 7. So the number of them with their brethren who were instructed in the songs of the Lord, all who were skillful, was 288. Now there's a special group in Revelation in the last days. How many? 144,000. What's two times 144? 288. Isn't that interesting? That they had uh, two choirs and how many? 288. That means each choir had roughly? Isn't that interesting? So when you look at Revelation, remember the keys are in the Old Testament. Sacrifice is part of worship. Nehemiah 12.43 also that day they offered great sacrifices and they rejoiced for God had made them rejoice with great joy and the women and the children also rejoiced. Now some people when they come to church and they sacrifice they go, oh no, not again. It's offering time. Should that be our attitude? Or should we just be praising the Lord for all of his blessings and I, I heard this one church, I don't recommend it, but when the pastor would get up and say it's time for the offering, they all broke into applause. I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying it'd be nice if the pastor said, it's time for our offering. Folks say, amen. <laughs> we'll try that today. <laughs> Let's see if any of you remember. <laughs> they go, matter of fact, yeah, we're going to have another offering in just a minute. He's got the baskets back there. No amens, huh? <laughs> okay. Romans 12, 1 and 2. What kind of sacrifice is part of worship? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And Moses was willing to sacrifice being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. All right, last section, priests and Levites as part of the worship. So they realized that God had specified that Aaron and the children of Levi were to be leading out in the priesthood and the temple services. So they needed to recruit them because they had gone back to their farms. Matter of fact, I'm jumping ahead to Nehemiah 13, verse 10. I realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them for each of the Levites and the singers, notice, the Levites and singers who did the work of the Lord had gone back to their fields. Some of them had full-time jobs in music and some were to teach the word. Let me prove that to you. Second Chronicles 7, in the third year of his reign, Jehoshaphat this is, he sent the leaders, Ben-Hael, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathaniel, Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent the Levites. So they taught in Judah. What was the job of the Levites and the priests? Just sacrifice once a week? Or were they to be scattered throughout the 12 tribes and their job was to be teaching the word of God and the way of the Lord. They were also the doctors, quite honestly. And they were the judges. For not all cases, but in many cases. Um, among the people. But when they were not supplied by the tithes and the offerings, they said, look, if you guys aren't going to help, I've got to support my family. They leave their ministry. They go to their fields. Jehoshaphat said, no, no, no. We need to be returning the offering and the tithes so they could be doing their work of teaching. Deuteronomy 12, 19, take heed to yourself. You do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in the land. So anyway, we did, I think, a pretty good job of covering the, most of the lesson here. I want to remind our friends we have this beautiful book that I think you'll enjoy by Joe Cruz called Life in the Spirit. We'll send you a free copy. Simply call the number 866-788-3966 and ask for offer number 155. When you do that, you can even get it right now by texting. Everyone uses their phone. You can get a free copy of this book. Just text SH047. Text that to 40544. You can download it and have your copy now. Thank you very much for studying with us, friends. Lord willing, we'll do this again next week.